I am joined today by our curator, Ryan Roney. Hi, Hello. Ryan. Hi, how's it going? Good. We are just going to have hang out with you guys today. And Ryan is here to answer any and all questions you might have about fossils. So make sure you're putting those questions in the chat unless you already submitted them so that we can answer those for you. But while we get ramped up and wait for some folks to hop on and ask Ryan all of the questions, uh, I just want to take a moment and go ahead and thank our sponsor, Century Bank of Cartersville, for helping us put on our Ask the Experts series. Um, also, just to make sure you guys know, we've got some really fun dinosaur fossil themed stuff coming up here at TELUS. Um, our fossil symposium is actually this Saturday, and Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have extended the registration deadline. Yes, the registration is open until 5 p.m. today. So until 5 p.m. today, okay. Yeah. It has been right. closing at noon, and, and any text that says that is hopefully <laughs> updated, but we are open for registration until 5 today. All right, so we're open until 5 today for registration, so go ahead and get in on that. Also, um, closing registration this week, but something you might want to get in on is our Dinos and Diamonds Gala. You can sign up for that through tomorrow, I believe at noon tomorrow as well. Um, and then also, if you follow us on socials or you're one, one to definitely keep perusing our events page on our website. Um, you might have seen that our next Sips and Science adults only event is called Jurassic Jamboree. It's gonna be a fun night of dinosaur and fossil themed activities and events and dinosaur themed drinks, which is the important part when it's a 21 and up event, right? <laughs> so come see us for that. If you wanna find out any more information about those events or anything else we've got going on here at TELUS, just visit us at telusmuseum.org. Uh, that's where you can find all the information about what events we have coming up and then also uh, anything else about coming to see us here at the museum. So once again, as we're getting started, make sure you're dropping questions in the comments on Facebook so that Ryan can answer them. You can ask him anything at all about fossils and paleontology. Try to stump the curator, you guys. It's a good day for it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, we're going there. It's stump the curator. It's the good. We should have titled it that next time. Right, next, next time. time. We're gonna do, we'll ho do a whole series. Stump the curator, stump the astronomer. Just do it, do it up right. So I, was be fun. Through, I was looking through the drawers today at fossils that I was gonna bring out, and I thought about one day we need to do one on just copper lights and to call it the Oh yeah. Too. Now, Ryan, did you bring a copper light for us today? I did not actually, because <gasps> I had so many other cool things to bring. I didn't have room on my cart. No, oh, no. Okay, well, start off then. Show us, Ryan, why don't you share with us the coolest fossil you brought today? Well, uh, this is actually going to be the coolest one right here. Um, it looks just kind of a lump of, of stuff with some layers here. But what this is, this is a preserved hadrosaur skin. Oh. So we actually have this Mesozoic um, hadrosaur skin. This was actually collected by our one of our former volunteers, Bill Montante, and donated to us. Mm -hmm. So this is, he's out west collecting this, but you can see that texture right there preserved, and this is a bit of rib bone that it got preserved with, but that texture right there is the old, is the, the scaly skin of mm -hmm. a hadrosaur. Looks a little bit like uh, when you have the, ch the skin on your chicken, when you, the, when you don't fry it up well. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. So you see now, that right Ryan, there. Ryan, I do have a question for you from the internet already. All right, already. Yeah. So Katie is asking, in your opinion, what kind of find do you think would be your dream find? Like, is something like this a dream find for you, or is there something else that would fall into that category? Um, a dream find for me would actually be first going to certain locations in South America and mm -hmm. collecting some sea urchins. That mm -hmm. would be for me the the dream find. I like to. I've done a lot of work on South American um, sea urchins. We don't have any in the collection here. Um, but those are collections I've looked at from other museums and have mm -hmm. been right written up. Um, but I think for me, um, actually, even better would be a sea urchin from the Crato Formation in Brazil. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few that are already found there. I'd like to go and find some myself and put them in the museum down there. Um, but that's uh, also a, be a great place to find some pterosaur bones and mm -hmm. maybe a dragonfly or some fish. Um, I don't have a fish from the Crato Formation here, but I have fish from Wyoming uh, or Montana, the Green River Formation, Montana. Let me mm -hmm. have that right here. Let me grab it. Yeah, they're in that really pretty, really light matrix. Yeah, so they, they mm -hmm. contrast really well. They do, yeah. 
So how's that? This is a really pretty fish from from there, from Wyoming. Now, Ryan, I know that when you're looking at a fossil like this, this looks very different from that hadrosaur skin and bone you were just showing us. How is this a different fossil versus the hadrosaur skin and bone? Like, what's well, the, what are the similarities and differences there? Well, let me put them both together here. So the, the similarities that we have going on, let me move this down and into your view. You see both of these have this dark coloration mm -hmm. with, with it. That's actually carbonization happening. So you actually have the carbon. This was a living thing. So that carbon is preserved. Now mm -hmm. the bones of the fish uh, probably have a lot more phosphorus in them. So there okay. might be a little bit of a difference in that bone preservation, but we have bone in both. That's a bit of bone right there from the rib. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the bone here. This bone probably has had very little um, replacement happen to it. As, mm -hmm. as fluids have worked through that, that this, this, this area. Part of this being carbonized is just the heat and pressure and, and actually stuff is burnt off in mm -hmm. a sense from that material. While this other material has a little bit of replacement that's happened there, but we have carbonization to make this, preserve this texture. So there's similarities there mm -hmm. um, between, these two, between these two fossils. Very cool. Yeah, we talk about carbonization in our third grade program about fossils. And also for anybody that comes to see us at the museum, there are several examples of carbonization um, out in easy public access in the fossil gallery that you can even touch, right? Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. So now, let me see. Now, what Ryan, was... you mentioned you mentioned that your dream find is sea urchins. So why don't you give us a little background about your uh, experience with paleontology and what your passions are? All right, well, um, I started studying um, sea urchins at Georgia Southwestern when I did my undergrad in geology. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a small school down in Americus, Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and um, actually, I think maybe some of my friends from there might be online, and I hope they throw some questions out there too. Oh, but, yeah, guys, uh, right? remember we're playing Stump the Curator. Please hit us up. <laughs> but the, but uh, my advisor down there, I worked on, on lots of fossil urchins from uh, Georgia and Florida the oligopygoids, mm -hmm. and um, did a lot of measurement, measuring of those and cleaning those fossils. And then I ended up getting involved in um, what are called heart urchins. Um, I have this one from Texas. This is Macraster. Um, you can see that star shape on the fossil, much like mm -hmm. a sand dollar. Um, but you see that heart shape. That's why they're called a heart urchin. Uh, mm -hmm. sp spatangoid is the group. And so in grad school, when I went to the University of Tennessee, I started working on this group, working on a group that actually is in South America, in, in Africa, and, and all over um, Europe and North America. Um, this, this species that is from Texas, there are relatives from this group in South America and in North America. And then there are other macrasters even in Europe. And so I like this group because there's a lot of interesting things to study in their evolution and in their biogeography. The biogeography being the, the comparisons across space. And then you can even look at changes in the group through time. So mm -hmm. this was the group that I, I studied, or, or a related group to this uh, is what I studied in grad school and I'm still studying. Um, so one of the other features on these that you can see on this animal, um, there's little pores right there between the points of the star. Those mm -hmm. are called the gonopores. So that's its reproductive outlet. Um, down here, um, you see this little moon-shaped divot right here. It's not very well uncovered, but right there is the mouth of the animal. And that's called the peristome because it's actually describing the, the, the shell or the test of the animal. So because mm -hmm. we don't have any flesh here, so the mouth is not there, but para means around. So this is actually the opening around the, the mouth. And then in the back, that little up and down oval would have been where its anus was. So that's mm. the paraproct. So um, you might recognize the, uh, the root proct from say proctologist. And then yeah. that's the paraproct. The, this is the part of the test or its internal skeleton that's around those, those structures. So this animal, didn't have a lot of nerves, but it does have a nerve ring. And all the little holes on these petals, those holes are part of uh, where, where it has tube feet that come out about its water vesicle system. And that's how it breathes. And also it uses those to collect food and it set, passes food around this curve or to that sulcus around to the mouth. This group actually um, lit bur burrows in the sand. 
So mm -hmm. these guys have very short spines. All the little dots on here are where there was a little spine attached. So mm -hmm. they, they look kind of fuzzy, but they aren't because those, those spines are hard. Mm -hmm. But the other groups that they're related to, um, you might be more familiar with, uh, with where we get uni for sushi and, and other things like that or look like this. So mm -hmm. the spines are a little bigger off of those tubercles there. The central part with the gonopores generally falls out on, on these. And then on the bottom here is where that mouth would have been and and slightly blocked by our specimen number um, mm -hmm. and some sediment that was in there. But you can see the broken part of that shell filled in with sediment. It's partially the last meal it had, but probably also stuff that just filtered in from being buried. But that's but the same. This animal still has the same. You see the, the five pointed symmetry, the little star like shape going on it. That's what those groups are known for. So we've got another question coming in from the internet. Um, have you found any carbonized sea urchins with preserved soft tissue? Um, I have not, um, but there are um, studies of various organisms with sea urchins and even other groups where mm -hmm. that carbonized bit, that carbonized bit, actually does let us know about their structures. Um, I forgot to grab a hyalith, which is a, a cone-shaped fossil that we find here in Georgia. Um, but they actually have recently done a paper on some from China where they actually will better, better distinguish the, uh, the structures to understand better about how it's, it worked and to prove that it actually is closely related to brachiopods. Um, oh, here, okay. I'll throw up yeah. a brachiopod right here. Um, we do love brachiopods. I, yes. And so there are hyalists in Georgia and there are brachiopods in Georgia. This one I'm showing you actually, um, we don't know where it comes from but it's related to some of the ones that we find in Georgia and elsewhere. I just grabbed it because it was big and knew it would look good on camera. Mm -hmm. um, so that you see that hinge line there, but the hyaliths, there's been a lot of recent studies where they actually have used that soft body stuff to see things. For sea urchins, I can't remember specific studies, but what's great about sea urchins is we have a lot of modern day sea urchins that still preserve the structures that you might see. So mm -hmm. we know a lot about their anatomy because we have most of the lineages of the modern sea urchins still alive. A mm -hmm. huge number of sea urchins actually went extinct at the end, Permian extinction. Only mm -hmm. one to as many three species is thought to have survived that extinction. And oh, wow. all, all the other sea urchins we have come from that lineage. So when, for somebody who uh, may not be necessarily super familiar with geologic time, when is the Permian extinction? So that's 251 million years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's the, Which, that's transitioning into the Triassic. So if you were coming to see coming to tell us which era would you find that in? So that would that material would be in our Mesozoic era. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so, so the the newer sea urchins that 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 macrastor I showed you is Cretaceous in age. So that oh. would have been uh, like the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, like the dinosaurs, and actually a lot of the dinosaurs we have on exhibit here are are late Cretaceous dinosaurs mm -hmm. this would have been middle to late cretaceous also um, and this is a group that um work still has some some species alive yeah i was going to ask what uh because as you were talking about your sea urchin and talking about how the animal would have worked you kept saying like and it it does this it does this and i was going to ask how similar is a sea urchin like what you're showing us here these fossil sea urchins to what you could still find if you went to the beach today you could go to florida or the bahamas and mm -hmm. put your hand in the sand and dig up a living one of these with its spines on there and, and going through the sand. Um, they, they, and you can even see the trails they leave um, um, in the sand. So the, the, these the relatives of this organism, and there, there's a side shot of that, that there, um, these organisms you could find today. Mm -hmm. um, and, there's our, and there are some that actually live in the deep ocean. And they, the way they eat, being that they burrow and some of them go down as deep as a foot into the sediment, actually is something that um, is interesting in how they take and stir up the sediment and it actually removes the evidence of other animals that have burrowed in the sediment and it also stirs up nutrients and sends nutrients back into the water column yes they're trying to eat sediment out of the, the out of the ground there out of the substrate but in that process they're stirring it up enough that they're actually putting food back up into the water column so mm -hmm. in, in, they're 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 kind of like little uh, recyclers Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they help with that. Yeah. So I have another question coming in. Robert would like to know, um, since you are our curator and you know all 
for our fossils. Do we have anything on display here at TELUS that is Precambrian? Precambrian fossils? Mm -hmm. We have a stromatolite, um, mm -hmm. but I don't remember if that stromatolite is Precambrian or a in age or mm -hmm. is just from another location and just represents stromatolites. But in that first little part of the gallery, as you walk past the um, the giant sloth and we talk about the Hidean and the and the Proterozoic leading mm -hmm. up to the Cambrian and the and the Paleozoic era, we have a stromatolite there. I I want to say that it is fossil and it is older than the Cambrian, so it is older than 545 million years old. Mm -hmm. But I actually don't quite remember. I'd have to check that label. Oh no! Have we stumped you already? It's 15 minutes in. We can't that, have stumped you already. I can tell. I can tell you where the information is. <laughs> <laughs> we can go hunt it down. Come see it, Robert. Come see us, and we can we can fix that for you. We can make sure we can get that answer. <laughs> All I right. Mm -hmm. I have to remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go look at that label after this. What? All right. Well, Ryan, um, since you are our curator, what really brought you into doing that? So you told us about what got you into studying uh, sea urchins, but how do you end up being the curator at a place like Tele Science Museum? Well, I was working um, in grad school doing my research and they had and I I had kind of thought I wanted to become a professor and 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 but I did like the field work did like working in museum collections and I saw the job posting at TELUS mm -hmm. and I didn't have any specific training for museum work but I had worked in collections as a researcher so I kind of understood the needs of researchers and I understood and I had had actually specimens that I'd collected go to a museum so I I had that aspect involved with mm -hmm. some of the things that I had done and so I, I looked at the job and the things that we needed to do and I actually had other job experience that actually applied to things at the museum and I have since learned since I got the job a lot of the various oddball jobs that I had over the years actually got me ready for different aspects of this job working mm -hmm. and shipping allowed me to take care of things and learn how to store things properly um, but I, I filled out that that job application just hoping that maybe I could do this and I got interviewed and it was it all went from there um, and I've learned a lot on the job to know how to do the job better um, but I have that knowledge of the material the knowledge of the of the of what we work with and that passion to take care of this that I think I've, I fit in well with this position and the other thing is I I want I've wanted I've worked hard to grow the collection we started with about 1600 specimens when I got here and we now are pushing closer to 4000 specimens oh my goodness um, that's a big jump so we've been I've been working hard on getting people to donate stuff they've collected um, mm -hmm. going out in the field and collecting you've actually done some collecting with me I so, have I have gone collecting with you and 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 once that stuff gets finished processing we're going to be adding a lot of those species to the list the brachiopods that we collected from Georgia mm -hmm. so. we even had one of our interns um, find a Pennsylvanian era plant not era but Pennsylvania time plant fossil uh, on our last collecting trip that is also going in the collection which is pretty exciting exactly it's one of the species that we hadn't yet found before at that location you and I have been to that site we have um, our, our executive director's taken a number of groups up there, mm -hmm. um, but we've been work trying to just really, in the collection here, represent the fossils that are known from Georgia, the various plant species and animal species, so that we have just a good catalog of what is in the rock record here in Georgia. Now, uh, echinoids, things like sea urchins notwithstanding, what do you think is the coolest fossil somebody could find here in the state of Georgia? The coolest fossil in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I have a, I have a few things. Um, I did not bring one out because the the big ones are out on exhibit. Um, megalodon teeth are, are are pretty far up there on awesome awesome scale to find in Georgia. A lot um, of people are very fond of megs. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I I I've been. I've twice tried to go on a field trip to go collect at the dredge piles over in Savannah and. One time logistics didn't happen, and the other time, um, one of the boats that they were going to use had the engine break down, so we had to cut oh. the group in half. And so I, I acquiesced and said I could miss out. So I'm mm -hmm. still hoping for my trip to go out and collect <laughs> on the direct files. It's like so, I need it. <laughs> yes, I want one of my own, and then some more for the museum. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, I'm trying to think of some other cool things from Georgia. All oh, right, um, I have from. Uh, 
Hanahashi Creek, this fossil. Oh, nice. If, do you know what this is? I can quiz you. Oh, okay. So that's somebody's tooth. Yeah. That's a tooth. Is it a Mosasaur tooth or a Dinosuchus no. tooth? Dinosuchus, you got yes. it. Yes. <laughs> now, we oh, do like, have wait, it doesn't look like Mosasaur. Yeah. Dinosuchus. Yeah, we have a larger <laughs> one in holding that is on its way to being donated to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a really cool Dinosuchus tooth. Uh, you got a little bit of the root there, and you got that enamel. And just just imagine having that clamped down on your leg. You know, look at the size. This is my finger. That's, you know. Yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> and so for anybody who doesn't know, what is a Dinosuchus? Yes, it is a crocodile. Uh, not an alligator, but a crocodile that was here in Georgia. Uh, this is yeah. Mesozoic era, so the Dinosuchus um, probably hunted the hadrosaurs and other large animals that were here at the time. Um, so just a just just one of the beasts sitting on the edge of the water. In it's our like simultaneously something amazing to think about and also nightmare fuel. Like, hey kids, there was this giant crocodile that could eat dinosaurs that totally used to live here in Georgia. So. <laughs> See, what, what, I, what I actually need to have in the collection, I need to get an actual American alligator tooth so we can sit them yeah. side by side for comparison. So you can, so you can just, if, if you've like, ever <laughs> seen an alligator, yeah. <laughs> exactly, so if you've ever seen an alligator, you yeah. can know exactly how big that would have been. Yeah, it changes your perspective. Even yeah, if you've got an American crocodile, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. regardless. Oh, yeah, even, yeah, if you have seen the American crocodiles in Costa Rica, um, yeah. even standing, you know, 50 60 feet up on a bridge looking down at the american crocodiles is terrifying they are very I, large animals <laughs> yes and yeah. dinosuchus was bigger even bigger so i have a practical question for you um from our audience ryan from yes. chris who is actually one of our volunteers here at tell us he wants to know what you think the best way is to explain what a crinoid is to a visitor so a crinoid because okay. that's one that a lot of people get kind of tripped up on well a lot of times people just find the crinoid stems, and mm -hmm. I have a crinoid here from Kentucky. Um, we get some pretty good ones from Alabama and parts of Georgia, but largely up in near Ringgold, you get a lot of um, stems. So this is the stem here, and in Ringgold, you get stems that are even as big around as my finger. Um, yeah, this is a Glyptocrinus um, diari. Doesn't need to mean anything to you, but what, what I want to point out on this crinoid is you see the stems, and those stems can be long. This mm -hmm. could even be all the same animal stem just collapsed when it when it when it was buried. But right. along this stem here, you then have the calyx or cup. Calyx mm -hmm. is just Latin for cup, more like mm -hmm. a chalice. Um, and then all attached to it are these arms. And you see how these arms have little feather protrusions? Let me zoom in a little bit. See how this thing does on the zoom. Oh, this is our this is one of our fancy dot cams, so you're good. So yeah, like you see the on the yeah. top of those arms. I'm gonna zoom in more. You see those that feather like structure on top there? Oh, I love this thing. This is <laughs> you're gonna steal favorite. it now, aren't you? <laughs> I'll just this, do a this a is request. one of education's document cameras. You can't have it. <laughs> oh, we'll get one for curatorial. But you see the <laughs> arms here. Um and on those arms you have the Siri. So these this is just further um just like feathers and mm -hmm. so modern crinoids sometimes don't even have the stem and so they can actually swim mm -hmm. they use these feathered arms to swim so you might see something called a feather star or something called a um, mm -hmm. sea lily these are crinoids today that are in the ocean mm -hmm. uh, but what crinoids did is they, they attached to the substrate with that stem held those arms out and their current let me actually put it like, let's say he's attached. You can imagine the stem continuing further down. So this mm -hmm. guy would open those up even further, mm -hmm. and the current would flow this way. And as that current would flow across here, it would use little cilia on the, those feathered arms to, to, to capture sediment and, and, mm -hmm. and stuff in the air. I'm sorry, in the water. And then it, they would actually f feed off of that detritus. So it would then walk that down those arms to its mouth that's in the center of that calyx mm -hmm. beneath all that. And um, some of the crinoids um, had other um, large structures that for their anus to be away from their mouth. But that the animal just had um, all kinds of fun um, structures to get the food down to its mouth. Mm -hmm. 
Because that's what we're all trying to do is just get food in our mouths. Yes. As yeah. much as possible. <laughs> that's 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 what matters. That life that's is all, all that about matters. food. <laughs> got to get those. Got to get that nitrogen from yes. from someone else. Very much. <laughs> so I have another question for you from Robert, and this is jumping back a little bit um, in what we were talking about. But you were talking about how you've added a lot of material to Telus's fossil collection um, as you have been working in your role as curator. Uh, what is the most satisfying specimen or exhibit that you have actually? been able to add into the collection in your time here? Well, we have a specimen that I'm working on getting in and it, I can't show it to you guys today, but I can tell you about it. A young man idea. collected, and now here's, and there's a disappointing part about this too. So I've, <laughs> I've been in the field with you and, and mm -hmm. I've been in the field with a few other people. And, and there's a day where Jose, our executive director, um, Bill Montante, the volunteer I told you about who donated the, the hadrosaur um, 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 skin to us. The three of us were out in the field. We had gone to a spot down near Columbus, Georgia, looked on this road cut. Maybe we found some, uh, some, some oysters, some mm -hmm. exogyra. But then we, we left and went down the road. That next week, that exact same area that we had looked, a young man found a hadrosaur leg bone. Mm -hmm. And and he 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 held on to it for a couple of years, but he decided to donate it to us. And mm -hmm. and it's 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 in that process. And so once it's fully ours, I can I can show it to the world. So we're wait up on that. Hopefully by the Sips and Science, I can have. We're that. hoping, yeah, we're hoping to have it out for Sips and Science. So if anybody was on the fence about coming to see us for Sips and Science, you might get to come see our new hadrosaur bone. So keep that in mind. It's pretty exciting. So, yeah, and it's not just any hadrosaur bone, right? No, it's the youngest bone from a dinosaur in Georgia, which is really kind of cool. Very uh, cool. We haven't yet figured out species or anything with it, but it is a hadrosaur. Um, and there's some debate, is it femur or is it tibia? Because you got some issues on the ends there, but we're figuring mm -hmm. that out. Um, but it is a hadrosaur bone. But what's, so it's very satisfying that that's coming into the collection, but mm -hmm. also that I walked right past this. Now, Here's the here it he showed me. Over it. <laughs> yeah, it just it got away. I have another embarrassing story about a fossil that almost got away. Okay, uh, I'll tell that one in a second if you want. But mm. the but the hadrosaur bone, he found just a little tiny bit of it, um, mm -hmm. sticking out of the rock. His goal that day was just to overturn every rock he saw. So he mm. saw that he whacked it with his hammer and it popped off, and he saw that spongy interior. And then mm -hmm. look back down and there was still some spongy interior. So mm -hmm. it really was just a little tiny bump on the ground. And right. so they dug it out and it was straight back into the into the into the wall. And and he he got that 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 fossil out and it came out in about three pieces. And it's been mm -hmm. reconstructed by a professor down at um, Columbus State, David Schwimmer. Mm -hmm. David mm -hmm. Schwimmer. And he actually has, is writing up an abstract on it that's going to be he is, yeah. mm -hmm. GSA this year in mm -hmm. in Denver. Uh, I believe that's in the early October. So, and also, if anybody is interested in meeting Dr. Schwimmer um, and asking him questions about this hadrosaur bone or anything else from his storied career, he's actually going to be doing um, the talk for our Sci-Fi Night on September 16th, I believe, is the evening for that. So, Dr. Schwimmer will actually be at Telus for anybody yeah. who's interested in coming and having a chat with him, which is pretty cool. And he's been a very generous donor to that collection recently. Mm -hmm. So. So stuff that he's written up in scientific papers, a lot of the Cretaceous material that's down there near Columbus, which is really the only area that mm -hmm. is producing fossils in Georgia. There is a little bit more Cretaceous to the east, but that material doesn't have many fossils. So mm -hmm. that area that he and his students have worked all these years um, is really a good place for the record of, of that time period in Georgia. And, yeah. and we've been getting some of those fossils. So we have that here at TELUS now. We do, yeah, which is very exciting. All right, well, tell us your other embarrassing one that got away story because you, you piqued our interest. Now you have to keep going. Well, so a big part about looking for fossils is having that image in your eye of what you're looking for. A mm -hmm. lot of you, you might play those those image search games where you're trying to find stuff. Or maybe even if you just know where's Waldo. You know what Waldo's like and you're looking for that <laughs> pattern of his shirt. Right. So I was down in Albany um, near the Worth Dam. It's It's got a um, just a nice white marble. Um, um, chalky area you can just go over there we have some uh, um, sea urchins on exhibit here mm -hmm. and i actually had found some sea urchins there that are the same species we have um, and i was just looking for sea urchins wanting to find sea urchins i was obsessed with sea urchins 
And so my eyes were looking for that pattern. I saw something in the, on the ground one, and I went over there and I picked it out and I picked it up and I, I felt it and I felt like just some, something like mossy and, and some like twigs mixed in with the rock. I couldn't quite see what it was and I tossed it behind me. Mm -hmm. um, and I walked just a little bit away as my friend had come up from behind me, picked up the rock that I threw behind me. And she's like, Ryan, you found a fish. Yeah. So this was the first fish found at this location. So, so and you threw it away. You're like, oh, I did. Not a so we went back to the site and we dug in a little bit more and we actually found the, the side fin that went with it. And so we found a little bit more of the animal, but the bulk of the animal was just sitting there. The, the ground had eroded away to expose mm -hmm. it. And yes, some weathering had modified what it looked like, but on my second or third glimpse after throwing it away, it finally I saw, oh yes, it is a fish. But even when they said it's a fish, I said it, it didn't even look like one to me. You have to get these things in your head. So right. if it looks weird, keep it. And later on, you can figure out what it is. So if you're out there mm -hmm. collecting and you don't quite know what it is, if you don't, it, you it, that's it. where experience <laughs> comes in. Yeah. Uh, so that specimen, is down at the Florida Museum, and rather than just having my donation name on it, it's mine and my friend's donation because mm -hmm. she recognized what it was. <laughs> yeah, she got it. I mean, I have a similar story for in, this, in our collection here at the museum, not fossil, something in our geology collection, where somebody else found it, but then I am the one that actually hauled it out of the site where we located it, and so we're both on the collection on, oh, the, yes. on the donation list because I'm the one that put it in a backpack and carried it out. So <laughs> that is a cool specimen. That is it, that um is. that's that church from Adairsville, isn't it? That, that Adairsville church, yeah. Mm -hmm. That we'll is talk our... about geology things a different day. Like the, we'll yes. talk about we'll have another stump the curator, but about rocks and minerals on a different day. Maybe well, for that... a mineral symposium. We'll we'll put that up in March. Well, I won't talk about that specimen, but that specimen is near some really cool stuff that's being found in Adairsville where we found mm -hmm. stromatolites. That's yeah. another thing that we've recently been finding in different parts of the state. Some of them, if you dig back into the literature from the early 1900s, they mm -hmm. were, they oh, there were stromatolites here, and that's it. They, they didn't care. But stromatolites mm -hmm. have a lot of interesting things to tell us about the environment and mm -hmm. even the environments that happen afterward as water and other events modify those mm -hmm. rocks. Um, so the, so the professor, uh, one of my friends up at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga is actually studying some of those rocks with her students. Um, that's Dr. Mm -hmm. Ashley Manning Berg. Um, but that, that material, as we're finding it, we're going out with, with rock clubs here to go collect some of those fossils. Oh, nice. Some, was, some people argue they're sedimentary structures, but I, it, took, it took an organism, albeit you know, microscopic organisms, to make that structure. So mm -hmm. you can argue whether it's a sedimentary structure or a fossil. I, I lean more towards the calling it a fossil. And and scientists and especially paleontologists do like to argue. Yes. That is, or if we're not arguing, what's the point? So I have a question coming in for you from the audience um, from Katie, who wants to draw some attention to the exciting things happening in the museum literally today, right now. Um, what was the process of getting our new uh, cast that we have featured in the fossil gallery today? Well, laying the Triceratops, we've had for, what is this now, 13 years, 12 years, um, yeah. just the skull of Lane was it was what we had on exhibit. And we had a, a generous donation that allowed us to get the rest of Lane. And so we, along with that, we got a, a baby Triceratops and three little pterosaurs to fly above them mm -hmm. to really round out our Laramidia um, environment there. Uh, which was the western portion of North America, separated mm -hmm. from where we are, which would have been on Appalachia. Uh, but we got in a couple weeks ago the two crates of these of the cast of this material, mm -hmm. and the crew from Treebold Paleontology who who built that came by yet starting yesterday, and we took that apart to open up the crates and put all those parts together. Mm -hmm. And then this morning they finished um, retrofitting the mount from when the skull was on just a post by itself mm -hmm. to get that to mount into the skeleton. Um, and we, it took, you know, what was that? Five or six of us standing around it to lift it and there were, it and, and yeah. it took, and it took two tries because the first time it stuck and it didn't go further. <laughs> so then we had to like pull it out and it almost stuck on the way back out. And then yeah. we set it down and we greased up the connection and then mm -hmm. we were able to put it in. And then it, we were able to get cut off the, 
they they cut off the bottom of that old mount and now it's it's on there so you have the complete on skeleton there. of lane now i don't know if you were there in the moment when we finished putting that together when the uh, weight of that head oh the creaking yeah settled into the rest <laughs> of the, yeah it, it was a sound that was not comfortable to hear but the thing held together like it was designed <laughs> to it was just the elements that were designed to hold that weight had to actually mm -hmm. take on that weight it, it was like, it's time, it's time. You guys can do it, we believe in you. <laughs> and it's there. It's it's now mounted and we're gonna get some uh, some little uh, platforms built underneath it to hide the, the bottom of the frame to that mm -hmm. helps it blend into the rest of the exhibit space. Mm -hmm. And it'll be there for everyone that comes to the gala to, and to see the final, um, final, final exhibit. Yeah, so you guys come see now. Lane and see. Lily and their little yes. tiny pterosaur friends oh, hanging so out. Cute. They're so tiny. They're so cute. <laughs> it, it, it's it. Uh, one of the one of the um, gentlemen that works um, in a, on an offsite locality here in the company was measuring for the base that's going to go on there, and he was mm -hmm. crawling right next to Lily. So it's just the same size as a as a grown man crawling, which makes it would make it the perfect size if there were mm -hmm. a real one there for a kid to ride on, but not 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 on our not on our model. <laughs> if that picture ever does see the light of day, it's fabulous because one person is posing in the picture, our executive director is posing, and then somebody else is measuring the baby dinosaur off to the side, and it looks like they're trying to hide behind Lily. Like, he was actually just doing his job, but it totally looks like he's trying to hide. It's, it's like a great picture. I, I exactly hope that did get the same size. <laughs> I hope our social media folks really... Maybe, yeah, maybe they'll go up on socials because we've talked about it. <laughs> to be fun. So what, um, and I just had a question as we're talking about the pterosaurs, what species of pterosaur actually went in? Oh, well, the one that we put up was actually a pteranodon with an unspecified um, description because it's actually okay. new material that the folks from Treebold were digging out. Oh. Um, so they've made, they've copied the model, but I don't think they've even written it up. So it's not even published material. Oh, um, wow. So it's just an unspecified pteranodon species. <laughs> unspecified pteranodon. Let's look. Come see our signs that say that. Always a good thing. <laughs> Oops. Or pterodactyl. Yeah, I can't remember one. Yeah, we have we've got the two pterodactyl and pteranodon. So yeah. both, but both pterosaurs. All the pterosaurs. Like I'm wrapping the pterosaurs today. I was trying. Like these are not these are not uh, seagulls, but they might as you know the birds. They're small. So. These 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 new ones are are, are tiny, so, which is great to see little. the contrast. Um, mm -hmm. We were joking, uh, if we had a Quetzalcoatlus, we'd need a much bigger room to get that one, because that was mm -hmm. as big as a fighter jet. <laughs> yes, they are. They were rather large. <laughs> well, and I also, com I already commented that the first time I take a group of third graders through there on a field trip now, they're 100% going to ask if those are the babies. Like, that oh, is yes. the immediate question we're going to get for those new species, those new specimens that are in there. It's like, are those the moms and those are the babies? Like, because that's how kids you know, can quantify looking at an animal that's smaller than a different animal. And we get to have that that fun chat about um, the differences in species and sizes of animals and things like that. So that'll be pretty cool. Exactly. See, the uh, one of the things you can point out with them is the difference in the skulls between the two mm -hmm. to help them see mm -hmm. that they aren't the same species. Like they're not the same thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I have a question coming in from Ellie. So for anybody who might have missed the chance to see um, our dinosaurs being set up if they were able to come through here at the museum and walk through. Is there gonna be any other way that folks can see the setup process happening? I think we did a time lapse and I don't know if that mm -hmm. was edited or done to put together there. Um, we also have had posted a number of pictures from that time period or taken pictures. So we'll see what comes out on that. Um, we'll see if Elise has got that time lapse completed. And I'd like to, mm -hmm. see, I can't wait to see that um what's what's fun is the completion of putting that together ends with the sparks of the uh of the of the angle grinder cutting off the bottom of the or, yes. or the, the sawzall cutting off the bottom of the of the former post that was holding up the skull um, mm -hmm. um it was it was a it was it's a good conclusion to see that thing it was a good conclusion with the sparks <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun well there's uh, what do you think has been the most surprising thing for you that goes into being a curator or working in a, a place like a museum in a in collections management? Like, what what's really surprising about that job that you weren't expecting? Um, Other than from, watching sparks fly on dinosaurs. Well, <laughs> aside from the sheer volume of paperwork that's involved, 
um, and and working on you know it, it it's it, to me it's the differences in material um, mm -hmm. that you have to be, consider as you because I do repair some some of these things um, mm -hmm. and there's a number of different different um, adhesives that I can use to repair things but you start to really consider what rock is in this and and the environment mm -hmm. that it was in and I think for me that 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 preparator side that I only got to do a little bit of in my research mm -hmm. I didn't get to do as much um, for me that I think has been probably the most fun um, mm -hmm. with with these with the with the work where I can take this stuff and go to the prep lab and explore how to work with that material and how to make that that specimen look the best for preserving the information that that we chose it for mm -hmm. uh, i think um that's probably the, the the to me the most interesting part excuse me of working with the collection is why do i want that specimen to come into the collection mm. why do what does it represent for the history of georgia or wh whatever part mm. question that we're wanting to ask what kind of preservation does that does that um represent and figuring that out but in that process getting to see okay how do i take care of it how do i preserve it better right. um i don't know if you noticed i was using gloved hands to to handle these you know holding these with your with a glove i mean with a hand is not going to really damage it all that much initially but over the years handling these multiple times and getting my oils or other people's oils on these fossils that 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 that'll degrade though that material mm -hmm. um, sometimes i have to consider um a lot of fossils were in environments that had sulfur in them so i've got to worry do i is, is there going to be pyrite disease that's going to eat away at my my fossils um one of the other things that um was was new newer to me as i began to deal with it is is bone if we have fossil bone some of that actually is radioactive so i have to consider <laughs> how, yeah. how are we storing that um and i and and and, and so all these differences that we have to do and then for caring with it what tools can i use to actually clean and abrade away and then what adhesives do i use to to put things together mm -hmm. um and and there's there lots of people have those experiences and and there's 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 paper there's there's papers on that there's how to's mm -hmm. all over um but a lot of it you learn doing and for me that's been a fun part of learning um, there are things I learned in grad school from my advisor, who was a, a former museum curator himself, but mm -hmm. there are other tools and newer techniques. And so I talk with other curators and I find out what they do. So that, that I think to me is probably the surprisingly fun part of my job. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So if somebody was interested in being a curator at a museum, maybe at a science museum like TELUS or maybe in a different kind of setting, what kind of advice would you give them for moving into that sort of field? Well, going back to the conversation where when I got the job, I got lucky that there was a job posting at the time where I was in my career, uh, where I was getting mm -hmm. my education. There aren't, first off, there aren't a lot of postings. Think about the number of museums that have mm -hmm. geologic or paleontological collections, and then that's probably how many curators there are. So only a few in any given state. Um, so, but there's probably a kid in every city in this country who wants to be a museum curator. So right there, you already think about the quantities of people that would want to do the job mm -hmm. and versus the spaces that are available to do it. Um, mm -hmm. There are a number of different areas. So not necessarily if curation itself. If you want to work with collections, let's step back and do that. You could mm -hmm. be a, a collection manager. You could mm -hmm. be a registrar. You could be a preparator because there are bigger museums where all of those jobs which are kind of entailed within my job and 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 the work of a couple of other um, uh, with our new our curatorial assistant and even the director of our department. We do a mix of all of those things. There are museums where you have a person for each one of those jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so so perhaps you might not be the head curator, but you would work in the collection if you mm -hmm. do those other things. Now um, there's then a couple of different paths to get to work with collections. You could be a, a, a topic a subject matter expert so you study that so you get a degree in that area of the thing that you're interested in and so mm -hmm. you you that's what you focus on or you can actually get degrees in care of collections and a lot of those are going to be focused towards art or history material mm -hmm. but there's knowledge in that area that would prepare you for the same kind of work that i do so there's a couple of different pathways in school to to learn to learn what you need to learn for that mm -hmm.
But I guess the best way to get started is a lot of museums do have volunteer programs where even mm -hmm. high schoolers can work in a collection. Uh, and that, and I did volunteer when I was in grad school at the museum at, at the University of Tennessee, and I worked mm -hmm. as a docent doing um, programs with with um, elementary, middle school, and high school students that came and visited. So I got to know how to present the collection. So I had that mm -hmm. kind of experience, but not collections experience. But there's different different pathways to learn, um, and that's I, I guess that's the best I can I can describe. I don't know that I have any further advice for anyone other than. Um, find out what you like and talk with people to find out what's a, what's available. Um, but that's, mm -hmm. I think, the way to go about it. So if you were not um, doing what you do now here at TELUS, would, how would you be involved with fossils outside of the museum? So um, my, the path that I was going for and, and aiming for was to be a, a professor. And if I had achieved that, I would probably st still collect fossils and be putting those into museums as papers are written. We have new material that's that's on its way into the collection. I've actually had um, two different um, scientific articles um, that were have been written this year from other people mm -hmm. that they've come to us and said, okay, we need specimen numbers on these items. So those mm -hmm. items are still being used by the researchers. Their mm -hmm. photographs and images from the studies were given to us. And so once those things are published, they're sending those items to us. And so those specimens are TELUS Museum specimens now that are on loan with those researchers. And mm -hmm. when they are when their papers are published, their material will be with us. So I would have been doing the same thing, doing my research, finishing um, publications, and those specimens that I would publish on, I would be putting in museums. But mm -hmm. likewise, sometimes there's just enough, so many specimens that you find, and they're not the area that you're working on, but you mm -hmm. know that someone else needs to, so you would donate that to a museum. Mm -hmm. um, my talk at the Fossil Symposium is going to be a lot about how people can help build museums collections. I'm going to highlight the way people have been mm -hmm. involved in building the collection recently. There are the ways that they are fueling research that's actually happening, not just these other um, university um, researchers that are sending stuff our way, um, mm -hmm. and people, but people from TELUS that are doing research on stuff that people have, have submitted and also material that I'm looking to find people to do research on. Mm -hmm. So a way in which those donations from researchers and even just hobbyist collectors have actually helped research in paleontology. Mm -hmm. But that would have been what I would oh, have continued. Sorry. sorry. No, no, you're good. <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, but that's so, what I would have done going through. Going, If I was not a curator, I'd be sending stuff to museums regardless. So if you were still out in the field or even, um, so actually we're gonna do this a two-part question. So first, uh, how many different countries or continents or anything like that have you been to collecting? We're getting that that question from our audience. And then if you could go anywhere to collect that you haven't had a chance to go yet, where would you go? Okay. Two questions. So first, I've, where I've been collecting, yes. um, I have collected across the southeastern United States. Mm -hmm. um, I've not actually gotten to collect outside of the southeastern U.S. in uh, um, it, look, I've gone to fossil localities elsewhere in the U.S., but mm -hmm. haven't collected there. I've seen certain things at sites where they say, hey, here's these mm -hmm. bones, but I've not actually collected. Um, I've seen, I've spotted some fossils in Costa Rica, but it's, mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't collect fossils because, again, it, it, some, there's laws in those countries, I, and so you didn't, you, know, you don't collect um, the, them there. I have been to mm -hmm. Chile and collected there. That stuff is actually in a museum there. I published a paper on that in 2018. That was some mm -hmm. sea urchins that we, that my colleague and I collected there. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been to Argentina and we collected um, echinoderm fossils. Um, I gave a talk last night to the Cobb County Gem and Mineral Society about those trips and the uh, mm -hmm. rhombiferin specimens that we found um, in the La Silla formation and the San Juan formation mm -hmm. in um, Argentina in the Precordillera. Um, those are at the University of um, Cordoba in um, Argentina, and that's the, that the university is associated with its National Academy of Science. Um, and those specimens are still down there because uh, spe uh, fossils in most South American countries remain in country. Um, so mm -hmm. my advisor, I was his field assistant, so it wasn't my research, but I was assisting him in the field. Um, mm -hmm. he, that material, he's actually gone back to to w look on it, look at it, and 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 write a, write that material up, um, rather than mm -hmm. bring that back to the states to look at it. 
I do have a, some specimens from Columbia that the geologic survey there um, passed to me through a, a colleague, and I'm working looking at some stuff from there, uh, but I've not gotten to collect it in Columbia. Um, mm -hmm. And likewise in Brazil, um, I've s seen a number of specimens from there, and I'm interested in that and read the literature on that, but I've not collected there. So I would love to do some collecting in Brazil. And now answering the second question, I'd love to do some collecting in Brazil, and it would be fun mm -hmm. to do in certain areas in Colombia. Um, I would love to see some of the material out in, in, in Northern Africa. There's so many cool, mm -hmm. uh, you've, you, everyone's seen the stuff that comes out of Morocco. A lot of that stuff that, that comes, comes out, the, the trilobites and all those things. Uh, we have mm -hmm. some really cool specimens on exhibit from Morocco, but it would be really cool to see that in the field. Um, but there's actually some areas in, li in like the Alps and in Europe that I think would be also really mm -hmm. cool to collect. Um, I've got one, one, one fossil from France, I think, would show how cool Oh, yeah, show us more fossils. So this is one from uh, France. It, it's a trilobite. Um, it's a phacops. But what, but what is that? You can see what looks wrong with that, too. It's not quite straight, is it? Yeah. So it's, it's been twisted um, by um, tectonic processes. So it's torqued mm -hmm. by being in the rock and the folding that happened. So it's not perfectly straight. It doesn't show up, the, the, the torque that happened on it doesn't show up as well on here, but you can see if I try to put it straight, it doesn't want to stay straight. There's, a, there's an angle to the side. I can't quite get you an angle that looks perfectly straight unless I use parallax. But that 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 has actually been torqued by the uh, by the processes in the uh, in the rock with mm -hmm. tectonism. So that's kind of cool. Um, I think so. Well, I'll do one last call for questions from the internet because we are almost out of time. So if anybody else has a question for Ryan, make sure you get it in. But Ryan, why don't you show us something else from uh, the collection of fossils you brought today, just to make sure we get as much of the coolness in as possible before we're out of time. Well, I've got ah, a of things. Sorry, that I've been zoomed in a bit. So these are little beetles um, in tar from the La Brea tar oh. pits. Mm -hmm. And I always just thought of these two beetles as just the similar beetles. But our intern this summer, Amanda Mayo, um, if she's watching, hello. Um, but you can <laughs> see right here in the back of the wing, there's the little features that are different, and this and the and their heads are have different ratios to the the, the parts there on the head. So oh, yeah. th these are actually two different species preserved in, in here. So cool. that, was, that was kind of a fun one. Um, a recent donation, um, you know, about a year or two ago. This comes from Florida. Um, let me zoom out. Sorry, zoom out here. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, let me zoom out here. Do you see this? Um, this that, that is the growth rings mm -hmm. on a mastodon tusk. So this is actually a part of mastodon tusk. That came oh, out cool. So that's not petrified wood. That is a preserved mastodon tusk. Oh, that's very cool. That's it's it's pretty material. I mean, mm -hmm. this this has been sliced and polished on this end, but that's just yeah, that is a fun specimen. Um, and you said that piece is from Florida, so is that part of the coloration we're seeing there? Yeah. So St. Mark's River. So yeah, it would have had oh, some okay. tannins in in there. Mm -hmm. Another cool fossil. This comes out of Nebraska. Uh, let me remind myself, this is the Brule Formation. This is a reconstructed duck egg. So a fossil duck egg. This is a donation that a program that run by the um, Flor University of Florida's Museum mm -hmm. um, of um, Natural History Museum, they, that they actually have school teachers go out and collect these. And then they have a couple of preparators who work year round. And so they gave these to us. That oh, was wow. a cool. That was a really cool, um, you know, it's a duck egg. So you could like mm -hmm. imagine cracking it open and making an omelet. <laughs> the very uh, dark yolk. So I, I don't know what else I could show you here. Um, I've got an Allosaurus tooth. So we've got some dinosaur teeth or Albertosaurus tooth. Sorry, Albertosaurus tooth. Mm -hmm. So you got that kind of that, that here's that ridge. Mm -hmm. you know, this, and then you got the, just a fun little the tip of a killer banana. Um, let me see here. I got an oreodont skull. Let me zoom out some more. This is a, a fossil pig. So oreodont. So there's mm -hmm. the, the, 
So we have a, this is again um, from the Brule Formation, Nebraska, but we have other oreodonts from the southeast in the collection. And so this one's had a little bit of reconstruction here to give you that eyebrow ridge, but we had that piece here on the other side where it goes completed. Um, so, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. so you get to see what was there. Um, and then you see differences in in the raw in this is the bone and this is bone the the light and the dark so this must have been a difference in what was exposed my mm -hmm. suspicion is that the white was what was being battered by the sun and then the the dark would have still been in the sediment but mm -hmm. it could it could be the other way I don't know I I don't have notes on that but you got a pretty good representation of this organism here there's some we teeth. have one last question before we are all out of time, and that's coming from Robert. It's a fabulous question, and they would like to know um, if if somebody has found a cool rock or a fossil, and they would like to bring it to tell us to get it identified. Um, what is the process for that? Well, start with an email to me. Um, the the email for both minerals and fossils is mineral ID at telusmuseum.org. Mm -hmm. So that email comes right to me. Um, describing it to me over the phone doesn't tell me do anything for me. I get a lot of phone calls. Oh, I want to know what this a lot is. Of phone calls. Start with an email, mineral ID at telusmuseum.org, and that will come to me and we I'll look at it. Please send a picture and tell me where you found it because mm -hmm. um, that helps me narrow down and what to think about because if you just send me a picture, it could be from anywhere. Mm -hmm. And because we get a lot of people that collect stuff from Georgia, but I've had people collect stuff from elsewhere and it lets me know where where to look up and where to think um, what might be in the area and then I can help them ID it and if, it, if I can't ID from the picture we can arrange a time by email when you can come and I can actually look it over in person with you. Mm -hmm. All right well Ryan thank you so much for taking time today I know especially because today is busy with the final build um, with Lane happening in our fossil gallery. But thank you so much for taking some time today to sit down and hang out with us for our Ask the Expert program. It was um, my pleasure. Thanks for the questions. And, and it was great to converse with you in this medium. Oh, definitely. And as a final reminder, guys, if you would like to come hear more from Ryan or from some of our other fossil experts who are coming, you can still purchase tickets for the Fossil Symposium through five o'clock this evening. And then there are also other opportunities to get involved um, with fossils or dinosaurs or any number of other things here at TELUS, Muse Telus Museum um, that you can find on our website, telusmuseum.org. Ryan, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Hannah. And Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.